All right, in this video, we're going to talk about bleeding. And this is chapter eight, if you're following along in your book. We have two main types of bleeding that we're going to talk about. We have external, and I'm going to write way over here. We have internal bleeding. So, um, first thing we want to talk about on external bleeding is an adult has about five to six quarts. This is the average adult, so this is not everybody. You could be a little larger, a little smaller, but this is the average 10 to 12 pints. And so if an adult, if you have rapid loss of more than one quart, Sorry, that's kind of hard to see. If you have rapid loss of more than one quart, that can e put somebody into shock and possibly they could die. So rapid loss of just one quart uh, or more could put somebody into shock or, or they could die. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it doesn't take much to put you in shock. With a child, because they're smaller, if they lose more than one pint, it can put them into shock and possibly death. So it doesn't take much. And, and really the key here is, even though you may have plenty of blood, it's that rapid loss. Rapidly losing blood can cause you to go into shock. So with external bleeding, you're going to need some sort of wound, some sort of open wound there to allow the blood to escape. And so there are different types of bleeding. Let's talk about arterial. And then we have a venous. And then we have capillary. So with the arterial bleeding, you're going to get bright red spurting blood. With the venous bleeding, it's going to kind of pour out, and it's going to be darker red. And with the capillary, it's going to kind of ooze, ooze out, and it's pretty easy to, to get control of it. So this should make sense. With the arterial bleeding, let's just talk about blood pressure for a second and see if this makes sense to you. So we have our heart here. Can draw that here. Oops. So there's our heart. Quick draw, drawing of our heart. We have the aorta up here, largest artery in the body, and here's the aorta going down through the mid portion of the body. Anyway, so let me change color. So when the heart contracts, forces out blood to the rest of the body down through the aorta. So left ventricle pumps it out through the aorta and it goes out to the rest of the body. So when the heart contracts, that's systolic. Systolic pressure. So that's at 120 we were talking about. So you notice here this pressure is much higher than the 80 over here because when the heart relaxes and the blood is returning to the right atrium of the heart, this diastolic pressure is the pressure on the arterial walls. So systolic pressure, that 120, is the pressure on the arterial walls when the heart contracts. And diastolic is the pressure on the arterial walls when the heart is relaxing and filling up with blood. So that should make sense to you that when you have arterial bleeding, it's really hard to control because you get this bright red spurting blood. It's hard to control. It won't clot because there's so much pressure behind it. With venous bleeding, sometimes veins will collapse, making it much easier for it to clot. So when you have venous ble bleeding, sometimes when veins are cut open, they collapse and it's much easier to get control of the bleeding then. 
With capillaries, it's extremely easy because it's just kind of oozing out. You could probably put a Band-Aid on it and uh, and get control of it. So there, it's it's much easier. Let me draw this out for you on how capillaries work. So let's say here's an artery, and capillaries will branch off of this artery. They're the smallest little artery in the body, and they're what connect. Well, they're what innervates the tissue to get blood supply to it. They're also what connects veins and arteries. So that point at which oxygen is unloaded. So here's our vein down here. So we have oxygen-rich blood coming down in this direction. So it's coming down in this direction, and it gets to the tissue that unloads the oxygen and after and loads up CO2 and once it does that it starts to go back to the heart so that's what the capillaries do for you so when you get those severed they're so small that you may only have one blood cell, red blood cell that can fit through each one of these they're so small so it's real easy to clot and how the clotting works on a wound is you have platelets so you have all these little platelets and they kind of crisscross and get stuck together and make this webbing across the wound and as that's happening so those platelets are kind of forming here and sticking and sticking together you have little red blood cells that come through and they get stuck to it and close it up even more and so what happens is it forms a scab so let's talk a little bit. Oh, before I move on to that, we also have um, natural responses. So your body has a natural response to bleeding to try to stop it. So let's talk about that before we move on to how to care for it. So your natural response here of the body is when a uh, as a spasm. So blood vessels will spasm and when they do they'll draw back. They'll draw up into the body. Now sometimes if the artery is not completely severed it won't draw back. It, it may partially draw back or but it may not draw back as far because it's still attached to the other part of the artery so normally when it's completely cut in half that's when it's going to draw back and the best visual I can give you that is Black Hawk Black Hawk Down. If you've ever seen that movie, there's a a um, scene in there where a soldier has an artery completely severed, and the the medic is trying to pinch it off, trying to clamp it off, and um, but the artery has drawn so back, so far back, he can't get a hold of it, but it's still bleeding, and so he has to kind of dig for it to get it out. Anyway. That's an example of a spasm, and then your other mechanism, like we talked about earlier, is clotting, especially if the pressure is not too great. So let's talk about care for just a second. How do we care for external bleeding? Well, the first thing you want to do is protect yourself, so make sure you have some personal protective equipment like gloves, maybe even a shield across your face if it's really severe. So that's number one here. We want to protect ourselves. There may be instances where you just don't have anything to protect yourself, and you can, if the person can get control of themselves, you can direct them on what to do and, and tell them how to apply the, the pressure bandage. Or it may be somebody that knows them and is not afraid to be exposed to their blood, and you could tell them what to do. But um, if you have personal protective equipment, wear it, and you want to apply direct pressure. So take your gauze and apply it and hold it there and do not remove the gauze so once you apply it do not take that initial dressing off it may soak completely through but that gauze is essentially forming a scab just like we talked about the scabs up here that gauze is designed that same way so this reason it's also good to have a first aid kit with you is that gauze has this mesh in there that makes it really easy for blood to stick to it but you may lay a dressing down, let's say this is somebody's arm and you've got your hand on it and you're holding that direct pressure, it may completely soak through 
and you can apply more dressings but once they get real big and bulky it doesn't become functional anymore you always keep those initial dressings on you can take the other ones off but the ones that are actually covering the wound you never take those off it's like ripping a scab off and then once you get enough dressing on there enough gauze on there and it's not soaking completely through or it's just partially soaking through you can put a roller bandage on there and be careful with these elastic roller bandages because they tighten down on themselves so be real careful with that because they'll get tighter and can cut off circulation and uh, you don't want to destroy the tissue below that side especially if it's going to be well so let's go up and talk about internal bleeding so with internal bleeding it's really do no further harm and the really the best thing you can do is recognize recognize that something is, is happening that they you suspect there's some sort of internal bleeding so recognizing something's happening um, is probably your first step uh, monitor breathing You want to monitor their breathing. They may have trouble breathing, especially if fluid starts to build up in, in the thoracic cavity around the lungs. And um, you want to monitor their breathing. Uh, expect them to vomit. So you may want to roll them over on their left side. You don't want them on their back because if they vomit, they could aspirate on it. And um, those are some things to look for. They may be complaining of a pain. They may have blood in their mouth. So... Um, and just because they have blood in their mouth doesn't mean that they have internal bleeding. These are all just indications. Have non-menstrual bleeding, so non bleeding. You may have they may vomit blood. And they may have a tarry stool, like kind of black tarry stool. And again, they may complain of pain. So not a lot you can do for internal bleeding other than uh, monitor their condition, essentially treat them as if they're going to go into shock because they're losing so much blood and blood's a thermal regulator. All right, last thing I want to talk about is minor internal bleeding. You have bruising. So when you tear a muscle, if it's severe enough, um, you might get some bruising or if you get hit, you might get some bruising. Uh, the best thing you can do for that is just get put an ass pack ass pack on it for about 20 minutes or so to help alleviate some of the swelling and uh, that is external bleeding I hope this kind of summed the chapter up for you and I will see you in the next chapter